Okay, I have the honor to introduce uh, this afternoon's keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Monica Lin. Okay, she is a professor at compu of computer science at Stephen, sorry, at Stanford University, and, uh, and she is the faculty director of Stanford Mobile Social Computing Laboratory. And uh, um, Monica is an ACM fellow, and she has also won the Best Paper Awards in uh, ACM Six Soft and ACM PRDI, and she has published over 150 papers um, on compilers, computer architecture, security, uh, operating systems, and high-performance computing. And she's also an author of Dragon Book. Uh, this is a definitive textbook for compiler technology. And she has made significant contributions to the field of compilers for high-performance machines and also open communication platforms of mobile computing. Her research has been widely adopted by industry. So uh, she has uh, uh, founded two uh, startup companies, uh, Tensilica, which is a configurable processor core, uh, core company, and also Omelette, an, uh, an open uh, mobile uh, gaming social network company. She's currently leading the Open Almond Virtual Assistant project. So today, she's going to talk about why the open source is important to virtual assistant systems. So let's welcome Monica. Thank you so much. Hey, good afternoon. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm so glad to be here to have a chance to talk to this audience. Do I need two microphones? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So how many people here have used Alexa? Google Assistant Home, Google Home, Siri. OK, I think a lot of people know what virtual assistants are. And what I've been very concerned about is that I look at the virtual assistant as a, as a potential threat to the open internet. And I think it is very, very important for the technologists, for the researchers to all work together to help create an open source virtual assistant if we want to keep the internet open. Before we talk about the virtual assistant, let's talk about what we are seeing today in our computing environment. And I think that by now, most people would agree that our privacy is at stake. There are very, very large companies, such as Facebook, that own and sells two billion people's worth of personal data. And this Cambridge Analytica incident is really just the tip of the iceberg. This is what we know. And the problem is so bad that the EU has passed this GDPR regulation in, the May, of the, in May this year, and what it says is that every, every company has to release all the personal information to anybody who asks for it. Okay, so this is a way for us to get some of, you know, to get our data back. But the question is, what are you gonna do with this file with all your data? Okay, you really can't do much with it. So how did we get into this situation? First of all, there is absolutely nothing wrong with what Facebook has done. They have done what they needed to do, and that is to protect their interest. And I think that the problem is because the, the technologists, we have not offered people a meaningful alternative that is convenient to use and at the same time protects privacy. So that's the situation with consumers. Let's take a look at what's going on in the, in the, in, in the industry space. And I think what we have is a pretty unhealthy commercial ecosystem. We see a lot of these platform monopolies or duopolies. You know, this is Mobicom. So let's take a look at what's going on with just mobile apps. Anybody putting a, an app out there on the Google or, and, or the you know, Android or the iPhone, they have to give Google and Apple 30% of the revenues. I'm not talking about profit. I'm talking about revenues. How many companies have a 30% margin? And by the way, you just put the app in the app store. They are really not helping you promote those apps. You still have to spend money on digital ma on marketing. And guess who's making all the money on digital marketing? Between Google and Facebook, they take 60% of the digital marketing revenues. And clearly, that is squeezing the digital marketing company's uh, income. 
but it also has implications across many other fields. If you just take a look at journalism, the revenues for newspaper ads went down. 2006, they got $50 billion. Now they're talking about $18 billion in 2016. So who's paying all these journalists? And are we really surprised that we have fake news? I mean, what people have created is a propaganda machine that anybody can pay to get their messages sent to all the individuals based on their personal information. So what we are seeing here is that there are a lot of monopolies, and monopolies are terrible for consumers. It drives away open competition and innovation. So now, you know, what do we have to expect in the future? Unfortunately, it's going to be more the same, but actually worse. And I'm really very concerned about the virtual assistants. The virtual assistant, the speaker assistant, was introduced about two years ago. In two years, they have reached 50 million adults in the U.S. alone. That means one out of five. If you consider the growth of the internet, it was 50 million in four years. So why this growth? The reason is that the virtual assistant has an extremely good, a very compelling value proposition. Today, we have our data spread all over the world, all over the, uh, all of, all over the uh, different resources. We spend all this effort, we've made a lot of IOTs. Where are all the data going, right? If to, to control different, uh, do different um, light bulbs, does it mean that we have to open different apps? No, with a virtual assistant, what they say is that just give them all your accounts, okay? Give them all the accounts, all the passwords, they will look at all the data for you, they will give you a wonderful, uniform interface, a language-based interface that is personalized to what you have, okay? They can read all your accounts and give you really good services. Imagine that you, you know, all these, all the authors here, the minute you accept, you got the paper accepted, the Mobicom, the next message from the virtual assistant would be, hey, here's a flight for you, <laughs> okay? Because they know your, your, your traveling um, behavior, they, they can offer you the best service. And what is going on here is that they are intermediating between us and all the different devices. You don't have to open Facebook to read your Facebook. You can tweet without opening Twitter. And when you search and buy anything, they are very, very willing, very happy to serve that to you. In other words, they have really got control over the access. And I can, you know, it is easy to imagine that Microsoft is not, I mean, sorry, Google is not going to work very hard to help you search on Bing. <laughs> you know, uh, Amazon is not going to help the grocery stores or Safeway to buy their groceries. It's going to be Amazon Fresh. So what is going on here is that this, is an, this has an effect on anything, on any service that needs to face the consumers. So this is why I'm very concerned. And as they know more about you, they collect a lot of information, they can analyze the data, and they understand very well how humans behave. And this is kind of what we are looking forward to, unfortunately. And so what I can imagine is that in the future, you're going to see Amazon, Facebook, Google combined. And it's probably one of these companies. We don't know, but that's the trend we have seen in the last 20 years. And it is not hard to be, be, uh, imagine that this is going to happen. And what I want to say is that the virtual assistant is not just one specific app. Um, I want to emphasize that this is really a paradigm shift. Imagine, you know, remember the days when we go, went from frame, uh, mainframes to uh, PCs? What did we have to do? We have to invent the bitmap display, the mouse. Okay, so that's the beginning of the graphical user interface. And now with these little mobile devices and IOTs and speakers everywhere, what is the interface? It is not the graphical interface. It's going to be the language interface. The language interface is extremely rich. We now have the machine learning. We have the AI to handle natural language. They can now talk human language. We don't have to talk computer language to the computers anymore. Instead of a graphical user interface, we are talking about a linguistic user interface. Instead of GUI, we are talking about LUI. And that is not just about virtual assistants. Any future service will have a language component in it. And as a consumer, we want to visit all the different services. 
with the graphical user interface, we're using the browser, right? With the um, linguistic user interface, we're talking about the virtual assistant. Instead of web pages, you know, the web page addresses, we're now going through intents, okay? So, for example, Amazon has 40,000 intents. They have 1,000 engineers putting the intents in. We have Google having one million functions. They're all busy putting in all these language interfaces into their proprietary systems. And instead of having web pages hosted by the individual owners, now these intents are hosted by the virtual assistants. So what does that mean? What we are seeing here with, you know, is really the beginning of, of a proprietary linguistic web. Okay. And you know, how many repositories of these intents do we have to have? We really need to do something about this problem. So we have been working on this problem, it's been about three years, and we have built a um, virtual assistant, an open source virtual assistant, it's called Almond. And the key idea here is that we want to put the best virtual assistant technology in the open domain. We want to make it available. Language interfaces are, exp are very expensive. It is not like the graphical user interface. You need to collect a lot of data, you have to do the analysis in order to understand what is being said. So we want to put this technology in the open source. It means that anybody who needs a, a language interface can tap into this technology stack. And as we are building this, we want to address privacy from the beginning. We want to bake the support of privacy into the system. So what we are creating is an open federated virtual assistants. That means the virtual, the virtual assistants can interoperate. You can choose who your virtual assistants uh, be, uh, are being hosted. The choice is very important. You don't want a monopoly that says, this is it, take it or leave it, right? If it is, because it is open source, what it means is that you can even run it on your own devices. Remember Hillary Clinton with, his, with her email? So the whole concept here is that not everybody wants to host their own data, but there is a choice. For those who want it, they can actually keep it on their own devices, and at the same time, let all the different companies compete for your data and for your, uh, and, and they can offer paid services that protect your privacy, or it can be free, and then they can, are uh, free to serve you all the ads. But what we need is competition. So we talked about open source, we talked about privacy, um, but that's not enough, okay? The truth of the matter is that consumers really don't care that much about privacy and open source. What we have to do is to actually give them better capabilities than what they have today in the commercial virtual assistants. So the idea here is that we really need to change how they think about this, give them better, uh, better functions. So today, if you look at the services, they are the masters and we are kind of like the slaves. They said, these are the rules and you have to play by it. I want to flip this around. I want to be the owner of my data. I want to be in the driver's seat. I want to look at all the different resources that I have. I want to be able to connect them and do things that I want. I want to take each one of them and decide who gets to see what part of my data. Okay, so that's the vision. This is what we want to do. So how? So the key idea here is that we want to be able to program our virtual assistants to do all the different things that we want, okay? In the past, programming is left to the developers. We wanted to make it available to the consumers, and the, re then the way we make it happen is to, make, is to allow them to program this in natural language, okay? So what does that mean? Let's take a look at an example, okay? Here is Bob. Bob has asthma, unfortunately. And it turns out that about 8% of the population in the world has asthma. And the idea here is that if you look at the, the technology, all the work that we have all created from the wireless and IOTs and so forth, there's a lot of ways in which Bob could help himself with, the, with, with all these uh, devices. But what, they, what he needs here is some amount of software to help him manage his personal and you know, personal uh, uh, situation. So the concept here is that if you have a virtual assistant that he can truly trust, he can trust all his personal information, health information to it, then he can do, make all kinds of things happen very, con you know, very conveniently. So for example, 
You know, he may have an IOT, which is a inhaler. He might want he, he what we want him to do is to be able to tell the virtual assistant. When I use my inhaler, record my GPS location in this file on box. Okay, this is something that I'd like to do, but the virtual assistant can do it for you. Now, this is doing something really useful, not just turning on the light and, tur and turning on the TV. Okay, so another example is that he may have an emergency. He is worried about that. He wants to tell his virtual assistant, let my dad know if I'm at the hospital. The key here is that the virtual assistant is his and keeps his private information. He has no problem if the virtual assistant is tracking him all the time. Okay. He's not telling his dad where he is all the time. Only when it is in needed will the virtual assistant share this information. So now we have sharing with privacy. And another very important need that people have is sharing. We really have done pretty bad job for sharing. Imagine a doctor who can, if, if he has access to the information, he can provide such better health care. He can say to his virtual assistant, if Bob's peak flow meter drops below some threshold, let me know. I can monitor this information in real time. I may suggest different medications, but now it is a, something that we can do if he is able to tell his virtual assistant the exact prescription or the, you know, the, the work that Bob has to do. And having a virtual assistant means that he can provide better care with, a lot, with, with very little work. Right? And here's just another example. It's probably very relevant here. <laughs> um, he might want to say that if you are uh, trying, if, if you are in a place with uh, poor pollution, then you might want to be warned so you don't run around um, in that kind of condition. So now we are saying that there's all kinds of information from services to IOTs. If we can connect them together, you can really you know, help the user a whole lot. So who's going to write this piece of software? Okay, is there going to be a commercial company that says I'm going to focus on asthma or whatnot? And everybody has different needs. The truth of the matter here is that if you look at commercial development, they will only focus on the most profitable use cases. And they do it in such a way to maximize their profit. There's a lot of technology we want to make it available to the individuals through this concept of natural language programming. There's a lot of power in language. We see this as a way to empowering the individual, individual consumers. This is also very, very useful even in professions. Okay, Doc, the doctor is just an example. Being able to monitor the data in real time is useful for healthcare. The stockbrokers can monitor the stock markets, the bank, but, um, the bankers, the insurance agencies, and so forth. They are, imagine that they can just tell the virtual assistant what they want and have their uh, um, routines be opt automated. That would make a big difference to the productivity of the individuals. And if you just look at the example of the doctor case, the information is being collected. And what it means is that they can now have a very good way of doing big data analytics and understand the interaction between medication and the, uh, and, and the patient's reactions and so forth. And as we show you in this example, we are also doing it with privacy. If we know how to protect privacy, it will unlo unlock even more data, especially in the case of health. Um, because with big data, we can really improve how we can um, improve healthcare. So that's the basic idea. Okay, that's the vision. So what about the technology? So let me give you a quick overview of how we make this happen. Here's a key concept. The first thing is that we have to have an open repository of these primitives, of these skills. We do not need a proprietary skill repository that belongs to different companies, okay? We need a one open um, repository of skills. We call this repository Thingpedia, okay? So it's like Wikipedia. It's gonna be a crowdsource and anybody can contribute to it. And it's open to all virtual assistants, including Alexa and Google and so forth. And the other thing that is different about our repository is that we want to support program programming. We need all these different devices to interoperate. As you see in the example, I want to be able to take the results from the, uh, from the inhaler and send it to uh, the box file, you know, the file in box and so forth. So we need interoperability. 
So what we have in our repository is a representation of the full signature of the APIs, the inputs and the outputs. If you look at what's going on with Alexa, they treat it as a dispatch system, right? If you say, ask Bing to search for this, they just send you to Bing, the results don't go back to, the, to Alexa. And if you don't have the results go back, you cannot create this interoperability, okay? So what we have is a representation that supports the interoperable web, right? So now those are the primitives. We now have to connect them together. We're going to use natural language. So how do we bridge this gap? So we introduce this concept of a formal language. This formal language is not JavaScript, it's not Python. Those are unsuitable for this purpose. We have developed a new language that is intended to be a target for natural language. Okay, so this is what, um, this makes it easy for you to create the translation from the natural language to a formal language. This is also a very different formal language. It is not a language for people to write servers. It, this is a personal web programming language. It's a language intended for the individuals to talk about their personal web of resources. What does this language look like? It is actually an extremely simple construct, but it is very rich because the construct uses all the primitives in the Thinkpedia. The bigger Thinkpedia grows, the bigger this language grows. Okay, so that's, those are the major concepts, the Thinkpedia, ThinkTalk, and LouisNet. So how does this work? So I gave you an example earlier. I said, when I use my inhaler, blah, 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 and I'll get my location and so forth, and I really don't want to write home into my file all the time, so I add a little clause that says that if it is not home, then write it to this file. So if you look at this English sentence, there are plenty of programming ideas in it. First, the WAN is an event-driven program. Multiple, it has multiple functions, the inhaler, the GPS locations, and box. We're calling different functions. We need to link them together using parameters. Here is the parameter passing part. And then you want to be able to check the condition, the, the location, whether it is home or not. Now we are doing conditional statements. These are the filters. So these are lots of the programming concepts in that English sentence. So what we have built is the first programmable, natural language programmable virtual assistant. It takes sentences like this and translates into ThingTalk. What does ThingTalk look like? It looks like this, okay? There's three lines there correspond to those three lines on the right. And the first line is that when something happens, so we are monitoring some information, get some information, you may filter, and then you do something. So there's when something, get something, do something. All right. As you can see here from this tiny example, that the semantics of this language is very, very close to the original natural language. And that is the key for the success of natural language translation. All right. And because of this, then, you can now build this, uh, this uh, neural network that does the translation. So what does the Thinkpedia look like? It is a repository of APIs. The APIs include the code part and the language part. Um, and um, what it is is an open repository. You can use it for any virtual assistants because our representation is a superset of what is available on Alexa and Google Assistant. You can enter the, assist, the, the skill once into Almond and have it run on all the different virtual assistants. So one of my students, he, she wrote the, probably the best Spotify skill she put it into, um, into Almond, and we made it available, so now she can use her, her skill on her Google Assistant, okay? The whole point here is that I want the skills to be independent of the choice of assist, uh, the, the skills to be independent of the choice of, assist, of assistants, okay? So at this point, we have about 60 devices, 200 functions, and what does a table look like? I mean, what does the repository look like? Um, I mentioned that there is when something, get something, do something, so there are three kinds of functions. So for example, we can say when Stanford tweets, if you want to say that, then you know, that's the natural language part, and then there is the API signature part. So, or you can get the tweets, and then you say this, in order to do this, that's the piece of code that you have to write. And then if you want to do an action like tweet, and then that's the code. So basically, we are just saying this is the English, this is the code. And now we have the full signature, and now you can compose them. 
So here is just a snap, <laughs> a high level picture of all the different primitives we have in the repository. Certainly, even with a small repository, there are just too much information. You cannot work with this using a graphical user interface. And this is where the power of language comes in. So ThinkTalk has a very simple grammar. I say when something, get something, do something, and there's a filter. And the filter is based on types. The minute you say that I'm looking for, I have a string, then all the operations of string apply. You don't have to type it all in. So this is a very type-based language. So all the examples that I showed you earlier pass into these different components. When something, get something, do something. Uh, these are all the medical use case, but you can just think of any, you know, there are so many ways of using the sentence. You may want to say when the Bitcoin price reaches $10,000, search for a Bitcoin picture and tweet it with the caption, I'm rich, if you so please. But you can just think of anything, you know, there are many, many different possible uses with a very simple construct like this. So how expressive is it? ThinkTalk is really inspired by this um, web service called IFTTT, if this, then that. And it's a superset because IFTTT has only the if part and the then part. And what we have generalized it to is a when, getting, and doing something, and a lot of filters. And with this service, they have collected 250,000 unique recipes. It just shows that a lot of people have uses for such a construct, even though it is even simpler than ThinkTalk. Um, but IFTT does not have a GUI. I mean, sorry, they have a GUI. They have no formal language, and they have no natural language. So we are the ones that are wielding the power of, of natural language and applying it to this problem. And the thing that bothers me the most, frankly, is that IFTT is 100% proprietary. And for example, if you want IFTTT to monitor your checking account, so for example, if it goes below a certain level, you know, you want to move money from your savings to checking, you have to give IFTTT your credentials. And I don't think that that's a good place to start. Okay. But we know that ThinkTalk as a result of this work is very, it is very expressive. So, so far we said that here are the snippets, here are the program, you can stick the programs together and you can stick the snippets together and it looks like sen English sentences, okay? So for example, I can say when my car is at home, it is not plugged in, send me a reminder email. This might be very useful if, um, you know, if you forget to do that, you may not be able to have enough battery to get to work. But people cannot remember those exact snippets because people can say the same thing in so many different ways. Remind me if my car is not plugged in and so forth, okay? This is why we need machine learning. Um, the problem is hard um, for several reasons. The first problem with machine learning is you need data, okay? We are systems people. We create new systems. There wasn't any language uh, pre-existing data that we can take advantage of. So it took us a little while, you know, we started this project about three years ago and we have a first design, but it took us about 15 months, I think, to figure out how to actually get it to work. A lot of it's in the data acquisition. Um, and so what we have to do is to take advantage of the fact that we have a formal language. We take the formal language because we have a grammar, we generate a lot of synthetic sentences and we take a subset of that and we go ask uh, humans, in this case the um, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk workers, to give us the natural language um, uh, equivalent of those synthetic sentences that we give them. So that's the basic idea in which we acquire a lot of data. After we get the data, what we realize is that there is a co-design problem. Uh, the accuracy of the uh, natural language translation depends on how you design the programming language as well as the knowledge representation. So we pretty much have to kind of do all the, um, uh, do all the, the experiment involves changing all the different parts. So give you an example, right? Um, I said that there is when something, get something, do something. The when is a callback, get is a retrieval. And different services provide different callbacks and retrievals. But those two things are very similar from a human point of view as well as from a language point of view. So we made a change. We combined those two functions into the same set. So any callback can be used for retrieval and vice versa. By making it more general is what we need in order to do the, to make this whole translation uh, to be accurate enough. 
So here's just an example how, how we have to combine the system ideas and machine learning ideas in order to do a good job. And the third very tricky part is compositionality. Um, with the simple, with even a very simple grammar, there is a lot of program that we can compose, and so you have to design a system that handles compositionality. Um, well, we are very, very happy to say that after all this work, we have now collected a very good data set. We're going to make the data set available to everybody, and we found that. Um, with a seek-to-seek by LCM with attention pointer network, we were able to get the accuracy up to 89%. Okay, so we started at like 20s, 30s, 60s, and now what it's showing me is that there that this problem will be solved. We don't know what we, it is. We are not soft yet because we are now using the paraphrased synthetic sentences. The next phase, we will have to get real user input. But just looking at this experimental result, I'm very, very sure that we will be able to solve this problem. Imagine, I would imagine that in the next few years, anything that you can say about how you want to automate the, uh, the digital operations um, can be done in natural language. The only question is, who is owning this technology? Is it owned by a single company? Does it mean that that one or two companies are the only ones that can provide good natural language interfaces? I hope not, okay? We really need to make this technology available in the open domain. So this whole idea of taking natural language and turning it into programs can be applied to many things. You can come up with many different grammars. A lot of the tools that we have, I mean, the tools we have will, will be applicable and we keep, we will be improving it so different people can, uh, can design new formal languages and expand the capability of the natural language uh, processing. But there is one area that we spend a lot of time on and that is sharing. Sharing is really, really fundamental. And what do we have in terms of access control these days? Um, for a lot of us, we still know about the Linux group sharing um, access controls. I mean, this is archaic, okay? And so sharing is really broken today. And if you look at um, what Facebook offers, it says, Look, I make it very easy for you to share with friends and friends of friends, but those are the only options that I provide for you. But that's good enough. And give me the data, okay? For this simple kind of sharing, I want to own all your data. And everybody is doing it. Why? Because there are just no good alternatives. And actually, the, the other alternative, to, an alternative today is that you share your passwords. Okay, so suppose I want my accountant to look at my banking statements. What do I have to do? I have to give them my, my password so that they can go and do whatever, including potentially taking the money out of the checking account. So this is pretty, pretty nasty from a technology point of view. So what we realized is that your virtual assistant is your best friend for sharing. Why? Your virtual assistant already has all your credentials. It can do, already do many things for you. And all we have to do is to allow the virtual assistant to work on behalf of your friends. Anything that you want, you can just ask my virtual assistant. As long as I, can say, as long as I say yes, the virtual assistant can share precisely what I allow to the individuals. And that means all the different resources that I have. Okay, so that's the idea. So what is the natural language like? We start with ThinkTalk. We just say anybody can use ThinkTalk to get access to my data. So all we needed to do is to add a qualifier. We say who can execute this statement. So for example, in the doctor case, we can say let Dr. Smith monitor, monitor my peak flow meter and so forth, okay? The rest of it is just a ThinkTalk program, but now I am making that available to the doctor under those circumstances, okay? So here's just another example. Um, you may have a security camera in your dorm room and your father said, I want to help monitor your dorm room for security. So the doctor, the father say, let my, you know, the question is, can your doctor, I mean, can your father monitor your security camera for motion? What do you think? No, <laughs> no, all right? Most students would easily see that's a really bad idea. But what the, what the individual can say is only if I'm not home, 
Okay? If I'm not home now, you are monitoring my home for security purposes because otherwise you are snooping on me. Okay? So the whole concept here is that when we have natural language, we can totally adapt it based on what humans actually need in order to share properly. And what kind of predicates can we put in there? Anything your virtual assistant can do. That is huge. Okay, so here are just all the different examples of when you can share what with whom and under what circumstances, all this in natural language, and they all pass to this very simple syntax that we have up there. So what we are proposing here is to think of the virtual assistants as a sharing infrastructure. I have my virtual assistant, I translate it into my code and it runs on my device, and you have your virtual assistant. So if you want anything from me, you tell your virtual assistant, who talks to my virtual assistant, through this um, uh, distributed thing talk protocol. What we are doing here is that the expressiveness is a thing talk, is an entire thing, any thing talk program. And we are using the remote execution model. Okay, if you want something from me, your code is executed on my device using with my virtual assistant. I leak no information except for the very little information or the precise inf information that I approve. So that's the idea. So let me run through what it means. So here is your dad and says, I want to see your camera. So he would say this in English to his virtual assistant. He's like, ask Alice to notify me when her security camera detects motion. So the assistant takes this information, turns it into code, the ThinkTalk program, very, very close in, some, in the semantic level, and sends the program to Alice, uh, Alice's almond. The almond checks against the policy, the database, and see if there is already a access control permission granted there. And if it is not, then the almond can just ask Alice. The whole point here is that we can do this on demand. Now this is, doable, this is, this is something that is natural. You don't ask the users to specify all kinds of access controls ahead of time. So for those of you who are working on security, you know that remote execution is extremely, extremely uh, vulnerable to attacks. So how do we solve this problem? The problem, the reason, is, the, the way we protect it is that when I send the program over to Alice, Alice take, Alice's assistant takes the program, translates the whole program back into English, all right, and asks Alice for the permission. Nothing more and nothing less. So Alice can say yes to that particular program, and that's how we can use remote execution to handle sharing. So at this point, Alice can say, only if I'm not home. So she puts a condition in there. This condition is added onto the original program. It is just yet another program, but just has got an additional clause. And now that program is executed by Alice's almond. And the father doesn't see anything except for the time when there is motion on the camera and Alice is not home. So this is how sharing is done, okay? So in other words, anything that the virtual assistants can do can be shared with that kind of fine-grained access control. So how do we implement conformance? We translate natural language into ThinkTalk code, and from ThinkTalk, we lower it down to SMT, Satisfiability Modular the Theories Formulas. Um, and um, I don't have the time to get into all the details, but um, SMT is a generalization of Boolean satisfiability with theories of strings, arrays, and so forth. There are plenty of libraries, very, very well-tuned and optimized, and all we have to do is to map the conformance problem to a, prob to a library function in these libraries. So we know that it's provably correct. So even though we are working with natural language, we are now dealing with something that has very, very formal semantics, and we are 100% sure that it is correct. Um, uh, SMT is NP-hard, but our experiment shows it is fast enough. All right. So that's the idea. That's the technology. So the hard part comes. Okay, we, Computer science people, we all understand access control. Can consumers understand access control? 
Can they actually handle a system like this? I thought it was very cool, right? What do they think? So we run a couple of experiments. The first thing we did was that we come up with a bunch of questions, ranging from something pretty tricky. It says, would you let your teenage daughter use your credit card? A lot of people say, no way, right? And then at the other end, we say, um, would you let your kid use Netflix? And a lot more people say yes, all right? And then we ask them, what if you are able to put conditions on all these different kinds of sharing? So for example, if you take the credit card case, it's like, what if you say only if it is used for restaurants under $20? And we discovered that a lot more people would say yes. Okay, so the blue is without any constraint, the light blue is with constraint, so you can see that it really expands the kind of sharing um, that people are willing to do. So those are five questions. We have no problems coming up with examples. We came up with 20 questions, and as you can see, it, it ranges from very few people saying yes to a lot more people saying yes, that's the dark blue. And then if you add the constraints, the amount or the number of people who are willing or happy to share basically doubles in these examples. So this is something that is very uh, meaningful to users. And the users are the people from uh, 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 AMT, the uh, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turks. These are not technical people. And what we are saying here is that with this system, you do not have to wait for Netflix to implement the parental control that you want. You can put control on all the different, uh, different kinds of services with the kind of constraints that you want. And as we show here, there are really a large number of different meaningful constraints. So the second question is expressiveness. Can we say what people want to say? So we go back to the AMT workers and we ask them, um, can you share with us some possible examples of access control? We'd never mentioned the word Think Talk. We don't tell them about Tackle. We just show them some examples and ask them to come up with other examples. So for example, I asked, uh, you can imagine the mom says, you need to follow this guy on Twitter. Give me your Twitter account, All right? And, and, I, and the kid would say, okay, at him, but don't follow any other Twitter user. Obviously, with a virtual assistant, we can make this happen for sure. But when we tell the, end to the, 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 uh, the people taking the surveys, they didn't know that it is being enforced. They are just coming up with examples that are meaningful to them. So sometimes they come up with examples that it are actually unenforceable. Here is an example. The friend can say, can I use your library card? And then you may say, OK, but only if you return the book on time. Now, that is not something that the virtual assistant can possibly enforce, okay? But you get the idea. We just asked them for examples. We asked 60 people, and they came up with 220 suggestions, 85 unique assets, and this is kind of like the distribution from personal data, IoT, services, social media, business accounts, and so forth. They're very creative. They have come up with all the different kinds of things that they want to share, and then they put constraints on them. And if you look at the constraints that they suggested, we are pretty surprised that 70% of the things that they want to enforce, we already have existing APIs for, okay? I think you and I, the technologists, have done an incredible job. You know, there are all kinds of things that can be done technically, but the question is, we have to put it in the hands of the end users, um, and um, this is what this talk is about. So 70% 70 70 is already covered by existing APIs. 15% are things that we should be adding because people really like them. 9% out of scope and a small 6% that is unenforceable. So we're pretty happy with the result. And then we, we have built the whole thing. We showed them the prototype and we asked people what they think. It's a prototype, it is really not a product. But we discovered that a lot of people say, hey, they like the concept, they do like the app, and some people even say they would use the app. But one thing they said to me when we were showing them is like, oh, I get it. This is like sharing without passwords. Because the only alternative we have given people to so, given people so far is sharing by sharing your passwords. That needs to change. So, in summary here, what we are talking about, what I have talked about is our Almond project, the open virtual assistant, and has three main ideas. 
Number one is that we need to have an open, one and only open, interoperable personal web. It should have all the virt uh, all the skills in it. Okay, just think about Wikipedia. Every you know, every corner of the world is putting up information about their services. In the same way, the virtual assistant has to know all about the local curry joints or pizza joints and so forth. Okay, this needs to be crowdsourced and open to anybody who has a service. And the virtual and it is agnostic to which virtual assistant it is that you want to use. Secondly, is that we need to add a new technology in terms of programming. We have created this concept of a personal web programming language. It is designed to be, uh, to be translatable from natural language. And so the second idea is the concept that we let individuals program in natural language. We have already got a uh, prototype, it's, we call this LUINET, the Linguistic User Interface Network. Um, and it is going to grow as we get more data, as we get more uh, data in bo both in terms of skills and in terms of natural language sentences. And finally, to protect privacy and openness, we have an open source, we have, we have open sourced our federated virtual assistants, and it's called Almond. So these are the three major ideas that I talked about in this, in this uh, presentation here. And I think that if we can all work together, I, we, I think that we have a chance to put the users back in the driver's seat in five years, all right? And if we don't do that, it's over. We have about five years, I figured, okay? This is really, I believe, our last chance for privacy and open competition because the virtual assistants are really, really compelling. If they see all our data, they do the big data analysis, they own us, okay? So we really need to have this open source system. So my team has been really hard at work uh, last few weeks and we just today as we speak here they just completely refreshed the website a lot more documentation and i hope a lot of people here could take a look and see if there is a way or help uh, give us some help with this and it is also an assistant that is available on android right now remember this is a demo of the technology we need a lot of help to turn this into something real and um, we are starting a what we call a massively open online project. Instead of MOOC, it's a MOOP. <laughs> and um, so far, we have, I have gotten a bunch of my colleagues. These are all professors uh, from the computer science department at Stanford. And they cover natural language, distributed systems, security, um, blockchain, um, HCI, crowdsourcing. So this is a starting group. And I'm very, very happy to say that I had a chance to talk to Mukesh Ambani this morning. And uh, in the very short time I have to explain the project, he said that he is very, help, very happy to help. Okay, so that's our first industrial partner, perhaps. Okay. <laughs> and anyways, I hope that we, will, we can get a lot of people to join in this effort to create an um, open source virtual assistant that can protect privacy and open competition. Thank you for your attention.